We are live. Welcome to 1989's The Punisher Review and Thoughts. So, I'm going to start by telling you this was a movie that I liked pretty... Yeah, I wouldn't quite say I loved it, but I definitely didn't hate it. This video will have some jokes, and I will get at least a little serious. Now, if you're looking for a review that talks about, oh, the movie doesn't really hold up, it's been outdone by little movies, because that it's no longer that much fun to watch today, and or it's different from the original, so it sucks. Whether you agree with that assessment or not, this is not that review. I will go some into the politics. And... Yeah, so, I realize this video is long, I'm going to do what I can to make it worth your time. I start this video with a review, most likely with zero spoilers. If I spoil anything, I will verbally warn before I do so. Hold up an index finger until I'm done with the spoilers. You can mute and skip ahead until you see me lower my index finger. As soon as I end the review itself, please note the rest of the video will have lots of spoilers, including discussing the ending. And... So, the movie is rated R, and so is this video, and there are no details for why the MPA rated this the way it did on IMDb, but I'm guessing violence, and there is some swearing as well, and drug content. Now, let's see. So, so yeah, regardless of whether you hate or love, you know, this movie, The Punisher in general, I don't hate you, I'm not, you know, when I criticize this movie, I'm not criticizing you personally. And, let's see, the, um, right, so my experience with comic books, I read comic books basically between 1999 and 2007. I was especially into Spider-Man, the, the current, the, the then current run. And, yeah, I, I read, you know, a bunch of X-Men, especially Wolverine. I quite like Batman and his rogues gallery. Superman, when someone who knows how to write him correctly. You know, he's a good person who sometimes punches things really hard. He's not just about punching things really hard. And I have watched all of the Punisher movies as well as the short, and I'm working my way through the Marvel Netflix show. And, yeah, so, I am basing this review on the version that's on Disney Plus Europe, and that is the only one I've watched, and I only watched it once. I got done watching the movie, like, let's see, I guess five minutes before I hit record. So... Yeah, the, the plot. Frank Castle is a cop, and his family is murdered by criminals, so he starts waging a war on crime as the vigilante assassin, known only as the Punisher, and things get complicated when, you know, for a while he's just fighting, you know, New York crime, the, the you know, the mob which is the the biggest organized crime you know in New York if you don't count the cops themselves and then you know the yakuza come to New York and yeah this movie the movie does have a lot of crime fighting but it's not only Frank Castle killing you know, mafioso, and I really appreciate that. I think that would be extremely boring, and I was actually a little worried, you know, when, when you just hear the, the, you know, the movie has a very negative reputation, and the, yeah, it is, ah, what's the word? I don't think that it deserves as negative of a reputation as it has, and, yeah, you know, I decided to review this because I like comic books, and I really, and I love comic book adaptation movies. You know, I watch nearly all of the, the current ones. There are a couple that I intentionally skip. And 
yeah, you know, I wanted to make sure I'd watched all three films before I got to the Netflix Marvel Punisher, which I started watching a couple of days ago, you know. I d originally, I had intended to do this movie before I started on the Marvel Netflix Puncher, but then it was October, and I decided to do a horror movie for every week. So, yeah. And, let's see. The, um, I think that, yeah, so the writing of this movie. The, this was written by Boaz Yakin, who has written 15 movies, and the most recent was actually um, last, yeah, last year. So he is still active, which I'm glad for and yeah he actually this is yeah he, he wrote 15 movies and he directed nine and seven so yeah seven of the movies that he wrote he also directed and let's see yeah so you know he's written other action movies yeah, he wrote The Rookie, which, not the best movie, but it has a pretty good script. And he wrote the story for the second From Dusk Till Dawn movie. Yeah, I remember the story as being fine. I've only watched it like once, and that was almost 20 years ago. Over 15, more than 15 years ago, certainly. And... Right, he directed Remember the Titans, which is one of the one of the two movies that he directed that he didn't write. Yeah, you know, he did a, a good job on this. Let's see. Right, so I have a couple of critic quotes. The film script, particularly a lot of the dialogue, Seems awful, which is surprising since the film was written by Boaz Yakin, who wrote and directed some terrific films like Fresh and A Price Above Rubies. The 1994 Fresh, not the 2022 Fresh. That would have been... I think he would have made that movie very different. No, I'm... I... Yeah, I really love the 2022 Fresh. Anyway, but in Yakin's defense, I read on IMDb that the producers rewrote his script. It does feel like a Punisher story. Yeah, I I could definitely see this does feel like uh, studio notes kind of yeah. You know the the characters are distinct. The a lot of scenes accomplish something like there are there are characters in this movie that. You know, for a while, you you'll maybe just see, oh, you know, they're just they're in the scene, and you're maybe you know maybe a character will specifically mention that character and to you know give some backstory or something. But for a while, you know, it's like I don't know why this character is really here, and then later in the movie, it's like I get it now. That's what they were building up to, and you know, yeah, it's it does a, a good job. Yeah, nearly every single scene gets us somewhere, which is ideal. You know, it furthers character development, it furthers the plot, it gives us some backstory. Not 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 every scene does all of these, but almost all the scenes do at least one of them, and that really helps to keep you engaged. And that brings us to the direction. So this was directed by Mark Goldblatt, who's more frequently an editor. And I think this movie may have started a curse because all three where the Punisher is the lead character are directed by someone who hadn't directed much, if at all, before, and either hasn't directed at all since or has only barely directed since. Even though all three of them are impressive in some way or another. Like, this is... This is you know, these two guys and the one girl, you know, 
Lexi Alexander directed the the uh, Punisher War Zone. They deserve better than to to be completely yeah. And yeah, the the this is right. This and Dead Heat from 1988 are the only ones he has directed, but he has edited. Let's see, Chappie, X-Men Last Stand, Starship Troopers, True Lies, The Last Boy Scout, Terminator 1 and 2, Predator 2, Commando, Rambo, First Blood Part 2. Yeah, you know, I do understand why he got to, you know, so yeah, based on stuff like the first Terminator, the second Rambo movie, and Commando, you can understand why he got, you know, why he was the one to direct this movie. This, yeah, there are a lot of similarities between the the action aspect, at the very least, of these movies. And he has also edited other stuff, but I chose to bring up the stuff I felt was especially relevant. The, the action movies that he has direct, that edited. And, yeah, so, other than this movie, worst to best Punisher film, both the, yeah, the film as well as the Punisher's actor's performance, and I, I do love all these, 2004 Warzone, and, uh, I'm holding off judgment, so far I'm really, really liking the, the Netflix show, but I'm gonna hold off judgment until I've watched all of it. All three of these films have a decent to good plot slash concept. Like I, I really appreciate that with each of these. Like they realized, no, it can't just you. You legitimately cannot just have, you know, ninety minutes or in this case, a like eighty four. I think of just nothing but a cool tough guy killing a bunch of people. You have to have something else there. You know, because having read a bunch of the comics, like some of the comics, it really is just that. You know, he's a badass. He kills, you know, really high-level criminals. That's basically it. And that's just, that's fine for, you know, it's been a while since I read a comic. I don't remember, like 50-some, 60-some pages or something, you know. Some of them you can read in like half an hour, you know. That's fine, but once you have an entire movie, you gotta have some more meat on the bone. Now, parts of the work print are here on YouTube in low quality. I think the quality may be about as bad as um, the home versions, though. And they feature 17 minutes of opening that are a slow start to this kind of film, but it's too bad. Dolph does some of his best work of the whole movie there. Now, let's see. Yeah, so, IMDb trivia, the late Stan Lee found the film to be very violent, but still gave it his blessing with director Mark Goldblatt defending it, saying, he's a violent character, there's no way around that. Yeah, this definitely is, considering, you know, a lot of Marvel comics, this is, yeah, this is very violent. Now, director Mark Goldblatt is also a fan of the later Punisher films, starring both Thomas Jane and Ray Stevenson, respectively, and feels that they were both different sides of the character, in which he feels that the character can go any way you want it to, from dark to brooding to light-hearted. Mark, uh, director Mark Wilblad thought it was a cool idea that the Punisher would be riding a motorcycle in the film, unlike his comic book persona. And Dolph Lundgren jokingly describes the movie as Batman meets the Terminator, and there's definitely some truth to that, yeah. Director Mark Goldblatt and actor Jerome Krabby are still best friends to this day after having worked on several projects together before and behind, in front of and behind the camera. Producer Robert Mark Carmen ultimately revised the screenplay himself and wrote the prologue that ultimately got deleted from the final cut. And that's, it really, there, there are some flashbacks to it. You know, at, at first I thought, oh wow, are they really not going to, no, they do show a little bit of, you know, and I do get like, we don't want to spend forever on seeing, you know, the what he lost, you know, and certainly, like, I, I, 
I'm not sure I would say that it really does the the that the movie yeah having watched you know the 17 minute prologue I'm not sure I would say that anything else in the movie anything after that point justifies spending that amount of time it it helps because you see what Frank was like before he lost his family and you know obviously like actually seeing him with his family it hits you harder now that they're gone but it really is it's it's not necessary to spend that much time on and you know most most of this film is like this this action stuff it's it doesn't have like a section of the movie where he's just reminiscing about his family so it doesn't really make sense to spend that much time before getting to the but it is honestly i think it might have been good to just to open the movie on the the very last bit of that when when the family is attacked and then you know yeah um let's see i think five years have passed since that i think yeah they, they say that in the movie so yeah you know show that and then have you know five years later and then the rest of the movie but the full 17 minutes i definitely agree with that it should not all be there now let's see right the the yeah so the the 98 minute work print version features a lot more violence let's see but that was forced to be cut by the MPAA and there's also you know yeah so yeah the backstory established the relationship between Frank and Jake as partners and I, I will definitely say you know that is like Jake is a prominent character now let's say, yeah director Mark Goldblatt was dismayed with their decision so some critic quotes destructive reprehensible marvelous fun let's see one man army action flick often underrated comic brand adaptation that lacks the trademark skull logo but delivers the superhero presence that the Thomas Jane remake sadly lacks yeah yeah this is definitely more comic booky than than that marred by cheese bowl sets and special effects lame fight sequences and some of the worst acting ever to disgrace the screen yeah I, that is I would not go that hard on it let's see And um, let's see, there there's a few problems with this movie. Number one, Dolph Lundgren was clearly still a young actor at the time of this movie. His performance isn't outstanding, and that's the thing, you know. So I, yeah, I mentioned, you know, the director of this movie had edited some other action movies I'm going to briefly mention them again yeah he he edited three other action movies from the, the 80s Commando Rambo First Blood Part 2 and The Terminator and all three of those have better acting performances from the the character who's like you know kicking ass and, and destroying things and such and just yeah you know the the all of them have stories that are outside of like you know most people have not had these experiences but the the because of the superior acting of those movies they draw you in 
better than than this. And Okay, so I don't really agree with this, but some people do. The movie is tough to watch because they cut it to bits and overuse close-ups in an attempt to cover up bad choreography. I thought the choreography was good, and I saw several parts where, like, they, they let a fight play out before cutting. And this is something, you know, once you've watched a lot of movies with martial arts and physical fights in general, you might start to notice that there is a significant difference between when the performers, whether it's an actor, a martial artist, or stuntman, or, you know, fourth option, whether or not they know the choreography and can carry out the fight looking good all the way, without any cutting, you know, and yeah, so I'm not comparing this movie to the Bruce Lee masterpiece. I'm just going to make sure I get the title right. Enter the Dragon. I'm not. I'm not saying that this should be as, you know, but that is a good example there are fights in that movie where the camera will just, you know, it'll it'll move to follow them, but there there's no, like, editing to cover up that someone couldn't fight. It's, it's, I will say, it's been years since I watched it, but I don't remember the, any fight cutting between, you know. There are times in this where it will cut, but that tends to be because it is, it wants to convey the chaos and the the sort of overwhelming nature there's at least one scene where a character is repeatedly hit from different you know by different people from different angles and yeah you know it starts with a with a um i want to say a medium shot i believe it is and you see where they are in relation to the the character which is also you know that's that's a good idea to have as this, and then it cuts to like I think some of them are actually point of view shots where it looks like the the you know I'm pretty sure stunt performers where the stunt performers are basically like hitting the camera which of course not quite that would be very bad for both camera and stuntman hand but yeah you know it it gets across that he's being overwhelmed which is not as easy to get across in a medium shot, you know. But yeah, a lot of the time in this, you know, they'll they'll have a shot and it'll it'll yeah, it it will it will show multiple punches and and kicks and such. You know, maybe it'll cut, but most of the time it appeared to me at least to be to get a an angle on it that you know, that worked better, that revealed more for the, yeah, but, but, yeah, I, I thought they did a, a good job on that. I, I think maybe some of the time they, you know, to, to cut out violence that the MPA, you know, objected to, and yeah, if you didn't shoot a good alternative, alternate take, that doesn't doesn't have the violence it can be very difficult to cut around violence that was removed in a in a way that isn't that doesn't draw attention to itself and let's see. the over the top violence and the one liners keep this entertaining the story is thin and the humor is poor. That is true. This critic said the Punisher is a boring one man battle with never ending action scenes. I mean, it's difficult for me to compare because I've, you know, I am now very used to the way action movies look today, which is a lot bigger than this. It's been a long time since I was still used to 80s 
action movie standards. For sure, I can think of at least there's there's um there's at least two action scenes in this that I I don't know that I would agree that they go on for too long, but they definitely go on for longer than a lot of other 80s action movies. Yeah, yeah, I think, you know, for the for the standard of the time, they were excessive, and I can imagine some people probably felt exhausting. And... The action, while typically 80s, is okay, sometimes cathartic. And it's uh, yeah, some some say that this is the weakest filmed Punisher adaptation so far. And a welcome shortage of love interest. I agree. That would definitely not have worked for this movie. That that would definitely not. I, I there are a lot of action movies where that kind of thing does work, but this is not one of them. Dolph's minimalist wit. Two arch villainesses attired in black plastic and other form fitting fabrics. And Director Mark Goldblatt brilliantly shows Frank Castle being unable to find a place to free himself from the darkness in his heart, thanks to Goldblatt showing this, that the slime which is rotting the city away is not being hidden underground, but instead overflowing the entire city, with Goldblatt keeping primary colors away. And that is definitely true. The, the look of this really, really works for, for what it's going for, for the tone. It was true to the character in most respects, but for the sake of budget, they changed his origins from ex-military, which would have involved more expensive flashback scenes, to ex-cop, thereby making Louis Ga Louis. I'm going to go with Louis Gossett Jr.'s role more of a kindred spirit to the man he is pursuing. I do understand those points, but it is a big part of the comic character that he returned from war and then started waging war on crime. You know, he re he gave up one war for another, I, I believe is the quote. And I'm not saying that no cops experience hardship, but war is very different from police work. I don't think it's a huge problem for the movie overall, but I do think it is ultimately a point against the movie as an adaptation. And don't get me wrong. I don't think that adaptations have to stay true to every single word. I think some of the worst adaptations are the ones that don't understand the difference between mediums and such. But ultimately, this does not distinguish itself quite enough, I feel, from just, yeah, movies. But, you know, I, I, I haven't actually watched one of the... You know what? I'm gonna have to look up. They're called uh, uh, Death Wish movies. You know, starring Charles Bronson. However, you know the. Yeah, I'm just gonna very briefly. Oh, okay. In the he's apparently an architect. I I thought he was a cop, but yeah. Let's see. Um, yeah, he becomes a one-man vigilante squad after his wife is murdered by street punks. In self-defense, the vengeful man kills muggers on the mean streets after dark. And, you know, I, I don't know, you know, I've heard mixed things, but some people say that the Death Wish movies are amazing, you know. And there, yeah, there are five of those, and by 89, there were four. So, it's just, you, you really have to make, make, uh, very, uh, what's the word? You, you have to make sure that your movie stands out. And, yeah, he's also wearing black. 
yeah, it's just, you know, without the skull on the, on the, without the skull on the chest, and with him having been a fairly regular person, you know, that's another thing, you know, I met, yeah, so I mentioned, actually, yeah, now that I think about it, so yeah, I hope I don't sound like a broken record here, but three of the movies that he edited, three, three of the action, three action movies that he edited, that the director of this edited in the 80s are the Terminator, so the first Terminator movie, the second Rambo movie, and Commando. And the thing that all of those, an another thing that all three of those have that this doesn't is that the protagonist, which, you know, in the Terminator is technically Kyle Reese, not the Arnie character. Or I suppose an argument could be made that maybe Sarah is the, the main protagonist, but one of the protagonists in all three is a veteran of war. And that does, you know, yeah, 100%, I get it. Th you know, those movies had the budget to send the protagonist to, you know, well, in the case of the Terminator, back from the future, you know, although only in short scenes, but yeah, f f war flashbacks, you know, and yeah, the other two, he goes to, he, he leaves America, he goes to another country to fight a war, and it just, it makes a difference. You know, Frank Castle in the comics comes back to America from having fought war. And, you know, depending on which version, it's the, you know, maybe... I, I believe the character started as a, Viet a Vietnam veteran, you know. And then some of the later versions, it's one of the more recent wars, you know. The, the Marvel Netflix, Frank, was in the Middle East, you know. So... The, the, um, I'm not saying that every single movie has to have that, and I forget, I think, was, uh, no, wait, yeah, yeah, the, I'm just gonna double check, but I think the 2004 one had been, let's see, undercover FBI agent, ah, uh, I forget exactly the. Uh, I'm gonna. So the. Um, Um, hmm. Uh, okay, yeah, apparently. U.S. Army Delta Force operator, former FBI agent in 2004. So, yeah, you know, it is, it is a very important part of the character. And as such, this, as an adaptation... You know, that's an aspect where it isn't as good as it could be. And without the the adaptation element, yeah, it kind of feels like, oh, well, you know, I guess death, you know, someone wanted their own death wish. And let's see, the... Uh, hmm. Uh... Crap! It's uh, I'm gonna. It's right, right. That's right. I keep. It's not executioner. It's exterminator. From 1980. And yeah, he also came back from Vietnam and you know to New York, and fights to. Yeah. Let's see and. It had a sequel in 1984, so again, you know, there's just not quite... 
yeah, you know, and he, oh, that's right, he wields a flamethrower, so that's, you know, it's, it's just kind of like, like this, this movie came out five years after Exterminator 2, which has in, both on the cover and in the IMDb, you know, the flamethrower wielding vigilante. Yeah, just, um, ideally an action movie should be, it doesn't have to be bigger, but you want to make it better than what's come before, and yeah, like, uh, I've only, I think I only watched uh, The Exterminator, the, the first one, once. I haven't watched the sequel at all. I don't know that I'm, like, wild about watching it again, but I remember it as being overall better than this. And certainly, like, you know, just off the, from what I recall, it's seven, it's definitely a much more violent movie, and that might also be, you know, like, maybe the, let's see, yeah, severe violence and gore, and there's a lot of, yeah, you know, if you want a really, really violent movie about a guy in New York killing a bunch of, you know, yeah, it, it even has right here in the IMDb plot, turning New York City into a great war zone. So, so, yeah, it's just, you know, this, I think it would have been smart of them to embrace the comic book origin more, because that is a difference. I, I'm not sure, had there been, before this movie, so, you know, the first Terminator feels like a comic book adaptation. You can tell that, you know, there's some, yeah, if it, if it wasn't a movie, if you just, you know, like, okay, so it's about a soldier from the future who travels back in time to stop a robot that looks like a human being. You know, yeah, that sounds like a comic book, you know. So, other than that, I'm not sure. I don't think there were very many vigilante, like, the, the you know, yeah, the Batman, for sure. The, the Batman. The Batman is the new one. The Pattinson one. Batman... From eighty nine, you know, I uh, I guess I could real quick check if that one came out before or after this one, and that one is definitely a better movie than this. Uh, let's see, it came out. All oh, right, they changed it somehow. Uh, where is the? Um, there we go. June twenty third, eighty nine for Batman, and this was October 89, okay, so this one did come out after, but not so long after that it could really have taken a lot of notes from, yeah, and, and, you know, yeah, also, I mentioned, you know, vigilante, Batman is a vigilante and a scientist, but he does not use guns, the Punisher does, and you know, that, that's basically, like, if you want to do Punisher justice, he, you know, he traded one war for another. He uses guns, and the, the, yeah, you know, the, the war is typically against organized crime. You know, sometimes he goes after other criminals, but he tends to focus on organized, you know, that, that is... Some of the some of the really big, you know, and yeah, for sure, this one he is up against organized crime, but you know the the other, you know, and and uses guns, but he did not trade one war for another, you know. I I wouldn't even really I'm not sure I would call this a war movie the way that you know again, like yeah, the other three, Terminator Commando and Rambo Two are basically movies where, you know, a, a soldier, you know, wages war, you know, and, yeah, you know, I, I don't, ultimately I don't think the, the skull logo itself is a huge problem, but it is also something that makes him less distinct, you know, and, yeah. So, the, let's see, right, more critical, 
Di director Mark Goldblatt edited a number of 1980s action films, Terminator and Commando, and The Punisher is a well-edited action film. It's Goldblatt's direction... Uh, oh, right. Yeah, the problem is Gold, Goldblatt's direction. He doesn't know how to frame a shot, doesn't know how to move a camera, doesn't know how to direct actors. His previous directing experience included second unit work on Robocop, and it shows... There's... Uh, yeah, there's some very Robocop-influenced shots in the film, that's true. The lack of good framing hurts the Punisher the most, except the terrible score. Yeah, the, you can definitely tell that, uh, you know, inexperienced director, and I think that was also part of the low-budget, you know, like, uh, you know, I'm not sure James Cameron would have been interested anyway, since... Ultimately, this movie doesn't have, you know, I'm not going to get into spoilers for the Terminator here, but the Terminator has a lot, you know, there's a lot there, uh, you know, as just, um, there's, there's a significant depth there, which ultimately there isn't really in this film. James Cameron, yeah, I've, I've watched every movie he's done, he's not really interested in shallow stuff, and I, I, I know some people don't like Titanic, you know, I I personally, it's well made, and while I'm not personally a big fan of the romantic epic kind of movie, I mean, I don't really think there's anything wrong with it, you know. Now, yeah, you know, I've watched everything he's directed, and he likes depth. He likes for there to be something interesting in the, you know, let's see, right, and yeah, at the time he was making The Abyss, which I know is one of his, you know, a lot of people don't really like that movie. I think, I mean, other than the ending, is there really much, it's, it's a, it's not, it's maybe not his best work, but it is well made and effective you know i've i i've only watched it once and that must have been 20 years ago by now and i still there there's stuff i still remember from it i mean that kind of you know there's there's movies that i watched you know i've i've already forgotten some of the stuff that was in black adam you know and i do still like that movie i do still think some things really work in that movie but there's stuff in it that I did, like, I watched a review, like, yesterday or day before, and someone mentioned something, and I was like, that was in the movie, wasn't it? I completely forgot already, because they, and that was actually something that they kept making a big point out of, and then there was no payoff. Maybe that's why, I, part of why I forgot. Anyway, yeah, you know, the, the, the abyss, it's really only, the, the ending was not what a lot of people expected, but it's interesting. And, I mean, yeah, I'm, I'm not going to give away the ending here. Yeah, you know, the, it just was not, yeah. And, and, you know, two years after this, you know, Terminator 2 came out. And that was, you know, that's much, much, yeah, that also has this aspect of someone fighting a war. And this, this kind of just, yeah. Now, yeah. So the let's see, the yeah the the opening gives us an idea of the Punisher's reach and the how how the war against organized crime is going. And you know, so the, yeah, the the opening titles at the start in less than a minute, I think maybe half a minute, the movie immediately goes directly to shit. By which I mean it travels down the sewer. And, yeah, I have I have a great quote here. Kicking the movie into high gear right from the start with a stylish credit scene that is covered in waves of Dennis Dreith's hummable theme tune. It's definitely a choice. The opening credits make me think I'm going to be watching like a 60s or 70s sci-fi series episode, not an 89 movie. I, yeah, there's, I, I don't know if that was just like, was that maybe a budget thing that they, 
yeah, I, I don't know. It's it's I I do not agree with the choice to to do the the opening credits like that. It's it's probably on YouTube here on YouTube if you just want to see how. I guess I can. Yeah, it, it probably is. Now, I am not going to go uh, give away in this part of the video whether the ending is happy or sad, but it fits with what came before. I think the ending is good. It's not like amazing, but I do feel like, you know, there there is some some closure and the the kind of like it does a lot of what you want a good ending to do. There's no Deus Ex Machina or other convenient writing. And that brings us to the characters. So yeah, Dolph Lundgren plays Francis Frank Castle or The Punisher. Now, yeah, before this film, he had been in Red Scorpion. Masters of the Universe as He-Man, which I haven't watched. Rocky IV as Ivan Drago, and A View to a Kill. Now, this so yeah, this was not the very first time he had to carry a movie. You know, he he's I I would say he's basically the co-lead in Red Scorpion, and you know. Yeah, his Ivan Drago is a major aspect of that movie. You know, if Ivan Drago did not work, Rocky IV would not work at all. Like, if, if Ivan Drago, imagine if he came up and he didn't tower over Rocky. Imagine if, like, his voice was this squeaky instead of this, you know, deep commanding kind of thing. You know, yeah. That is, that is, the, the movie simply would not work with, without that and yeah it's, I, I think he ultimately could have I, I don't think it's completely his fault and yeah so yeah after this he played he was in the Dark Angel 1990 movie he was in Universal Soldier as Andrew Scott, and he was in Johnny Mnemonic as the Street Preacher. Now, those are three movies where I love his performance. Absolutely spot-on performance. It's exactly what I wanted out of it. You know, and let's see. Right, I have also seen him in the Expendables movies as Gunnar Jensen, and the first Aquaman movie as King Nereus, and I mean, he's he is memorable in the Expendables movies. He's he's one of the like, you know. Obviously, we're gonna tune at least some of them out when there's so such a ridiculous heavy amount of just ah, what's it called uh, t testosterone on constant display, you know. But yeah, he's he's one that I do remember from from the ones of those movies that he's in, if he's in more than one. I'm not going to give away for people who haven't watched them. The, uh, let's see. Yeah, I'm, I'm really glad that the role was played by Dolph. He can do dark, terrifying, as in Johnny Mnemonic and Universal Soldier. And honestly, I feel like if he had played this role the way he played Andrew Scott, but I can imagine that might have been you know, I'm not a fan of the director of Universal Soldier, whose name is Roland Emmerich. Universal Soldier is the only movie of his that I like, and I've watched, let's see, what was the most recent one I watched? Uh, 2012. I've watched every movie he has directed uh, hold on. Just to make absolutely sure I'm not talking out my ass here. Okay, I'm not 100% certain if I watch The Patriot, but I think so. Every movie he's made, from Moon 44 up to and including... Yeah, yeah. Up to and including 2012, and the only one I like is Universal Soldier. But I do think that... Under the right circumstances, the way he, you know, he can really get some great performances out of his actors. And, yeah, I just, 
I really wish that the the you know that's the it's it is kind of ridiculous that we expect a director to be great at everything every aspect of filmmaking but but yeah you know I kind of wish that they had had a like co-director who could take care of the actors because the, the his performance in this is the kind of thing that just yeah if he's given no guidance because again you know yeah his his performance in in Johnny Mnemonic it it is base it's it's very baseline Dolph you know it's it's kind of it's not what he is like in real life I've seen interviews with the guy he's he's much nicer than his character it just he knows what he looks like you know he's he's a towering giant a you know massive beefcake he kind of has to play you know he, he has played heroic roles also but he's really really good at the kind of, of villain you know yeah and yeah in in you know I, uh, I forget who was it that directed the fourth Rocky was it was it Stallone who directed it it was Stallone he both wrote and directed it and Sylvester Stallone himself sometimes like a, a bunch of times he does not do the best job acting himself but under the right circumstances like when you see him play Rocky when you see him play Rambo like you know there's a reason I've watched I, let's see I've watched the first five Rocky movies I'm still looking for a sale on the the more recent ones and I've watched all five Rambo movies so yeah, you know, I, I wouldn't be doing that if I didn't enjoy, you know, and again, there's definitely, there there's some weak spots in some of these movies, but yeah, you know, and I can certainly see how he could also get a great performance out of, yeah, Dolph Lundgren and, let's see, yeah, you know, the, the, yeah. Once again, I'm glad the role was played by Dolph, who can do this kind of dark and terrifying. And and I mean, Frank Castle, if you do, if you do the character justice, he's supposed to be kind of off-putting. He's not. We're not supposed to be cheering him on. We're supposed to be a little like, you know, he's fighting a war. War is ugly. I I I'm glad that it wasn't Schwarzenegger. Much as I love his work. He would have tried to make Frank more appealing, like he typically did back when he was big. Stallone could have done it, but would have insisted on a big moral speech, like the first Rambo movie, like Cobra. Obviously, those two were way bigger than Dolph in 89. This movie was low budget. That's why it wasn't either of them. Bruce Willis would have made Frank too human and relatable. Van Damme, same complaints as with Arnie. Although Van Damme has also you know some of his roles he is very unpleasant and yeah now let's see right so IMDb trivia despite an unfounded rumor that Marvel didn't grant the filmmakers the use of the skull logo the comic book company actually supported the production of the film and was involved figures such as Stanley R.I.P. Carl Potts and Tom DeFalco served as consultants but not as much as they would since the 2000s at the time Marvel was actually owned by the production company New World Pictures who had bought the comic company and their characters a couple years prior Dolph Lundgren physically prepared for the film by revisiting the training regimen from his days as a competitive martial artist. During production, he weighed 220 pounds, the same weight he held as an international karate champion. And that really does show, like, you never doubt that he can take on all these guys, you know. Not every, like, Frank Castle, a bunch of the people he fights are just, you know, maybe good with a gun or something, but they're not, like, huge guys. But he has to, he's hes on his own against them, you know, he may have to take down, you know, a dozen people with, with you know, more or less at the same time, or right after, one right after the other, so he has to be, yeah. Dolph Lundgren helped revise the Punisher's monologue to be more comfortable saying, oh, com monologues to be comfortable saying them. 
Christopher Lambert was director Mark Goldblatt's first choice for the role of Frank Castle, but Lambert injured his ankle and was unable to accept the role. I gotta say, Lambert is fun to watch. I've I've never every single movie I've seen him in, he's he's fun to watch. Even the ones where they really don't know how to use him, but I don't think that he would completely have had the can't I mean can he do darkness quite as well as Dolph Lundgren? I don't know. I haven't watched every movie he's in. Um but based on the ones I've seen, I, I don't think so. He's a little too likable and kind of just, yeah. Despite the urban legend, Michael Pere was not the producer's original choice for Frank Castle. Pere denied they even approached him. He, he would have been okay. He, you know, yeah. Michael Pere would, would definitely have... have been been fine for at least although yeah the, the physical aspect Dolph Lundgren has him beat but he he can do dark I've seen him uh, yeah and actually yeah I'm pretty sure I've seen at least one movie where he goes through this same thing like the, losing his family and or at least going through a tragedy and then becoming an Avenger and yeah not member of the Avengers but uh, yeah violent vigilante. Director Mark Goldblatt said the controversy behind the missing Puncher Skull logo was because they wanted to do something different with the character, unlike the version of the character that was presented in the comics with a spandex suit with the big skull on his chest. He does regret on using the logo, which might have helped the film gain a theatrical release. I agree with not doing spandex, but the skull is iconic. I get wanting to get away from comic book stuff if you're worried it'll hurt profits. But then how do you explain this speaks in rhyme attracted by remote controlled RC with liquor bottle unhoused character shake? And it doesn't have to be a white skull. I get, you know, oh, that attracts attention. It could be like dark gray, similar to how they handled most of the MCU Captain America suits. Darker shades so they can be used stealthily. You know, yeah, I guess at the at the time, I mean, Batman had a fairly visible logo on his on on the front of his suit and he's trying to do stealth a lot of the time you know so yeah i am um, and and again you know maybe that wasn't maybe they didn't realize and, and i think that was also that that was like a rubber suit and more expense and and you know don't put punisher in rubber i implore you i beg of you do not put the punisher in rubber but the yeah, I, I wish they had had it toned down, uh, you know, the, yeah, it's it's also somewhat toned down in Punisher Warzone, the movie, I forget, yeah, yeah, in the, in the 2004 movie, he does wear it at least some of the time, and it's this, uh, you know, washed out kind of, uh, yeah. And certainly they didn't have to go so far away from the look. The trench coat is gone as well. This is almost just a run-of-the-mill looking 80s getting revenge for dead loved ones protagonist when he should be standing out more. This could easily have been an Exterminator sequel. Depending on which review you read, the fact that he doesn't have a skull in his chest doesn't matter and you're honestly really stupid for wanting there. Sure, it's annoying, but the movie's still good. Or it completely ruined the movie. It doesn't bother me that much personally. But I really don't think you should get angry at people who are passionate about it. And, yeah. Unlike the comic book, Frank Castle does not wear the skull on his chest, but it's on the daggers he uses, as well as his face made up on Dolph Lundgren's fake beard, which it's a little unfortunate with the fake beard because some of the time you can tell, oh, I can actually see the real uh, stubble under there. So that, yeah. But that does help a lot. The skull, like most comic book symbols, is supposed to make it clear who it is. You know, some you some heroes use them to reassure others they're one of the good guys, which is obviously extremely important when everyone's running around wearing masks. And most good guys will inflict violence just only on bad guys. Imagine coming across a bunch of masked people beating each up each other up, known with a symbol on their clothing suit. You wouldn't know who's good and who's bad. Some use them to spread fear in the bad guys. Some use them for both. Leaving behind the daggers with the skull does mean that you know that's who attacked, you know, and they and and the movie specifically calls attention to this, uh, you know, the they're they're never 
they never doubt that this was the Punisher who did this because he left behind at least one knife with with the skull logo on the ah what are they, what are they called again the not not the tip of the knife but the other end you know and yeah you know the the part of the idea here is to to make people fear seeing the skull the way that Batman uses the the logo and his very distinctive look to uh, you know and and I will also acknowledge the you know the 1989 Batman is a stylized movie this one is a bit closer to this kind of gritty reality and uh, yeah there's there's not much that would work in both of them Director Mark, Mark Goldblatt was pleasantly surprised when Dolph Lundgren told him that he was a martial arts practitioner and was able to perfectly do the stunts in the film during the fight sequences with the Yakuza soldiers. And it really shows. It, it helps a lot that that is uh, the case. It was rumored that Dolph Lundgren went without sleep to achieve the look of Frank Castle. And that maybe helps explain his performance. I'm not saying this kind of thing is always bad. It certainly helped Hugh Jackman nail Wolverine when he took a cold shower before every day of shooting. On at least the first, I'm not 100% certain if he kept it up. I could understand if he didn't. And just felt like, you know what, I'll get there. I'll get there without it. But I would definitely say that going without sleep hurt the performance. I think cold showers would have been a much better idea. And let's see. Steven Seagal also expressed interest in playing Frank Castle, the Punisher. I could kind of see that, but again, I think, you know, the, the Seagal movies I've watched, he talks a lot more, and there tends to be this, the, the, this kind of Eastern philosophy thing where, you know, Frank is, he doesn't, at least in this movie, he he's just there for the killing of these guys, you know. Now, let's see, yeah, so some, uh, yeah, some other critic, some, right, those were IMDb trailer, this is some, yeah, some critic quotes, Lundgren looks like he needs a bath badly, mumbling boar fest, Lundgren's staggeringly zombified performance, and it, yeah, I, maybe it's just a rumor. But the fact that it's credible at all, like, if I, you know, if if I heard someone say, oh, you know, Matt Damon went without sleep when he did the, the Bourne movies, I'd be like, that is bullshit, there's no way you can tell from his performance he's completely alert. Again, I'm not saying that that's the kind of performance you necessar necessarily need here, but you definitely needed something that was way more alert than this it or if you if you want to do it like this it kind of needs to be like a punisher who's maybe you know maybe he feels like he's getting too old and he's kind of resigned he's not doing the punishing anymore that could make i'm, I'm not sure i'd watch an entire movie but maybe like a short film about that kind of thing yeah that that could be interesting but it does not work for for this Lundgren, an inexpressive actor, is perfect as a graphic cipher. His face was made to be drawn in ink and filled in with broad washes of color. Carefully tended facial stubble trimmed to give him a skull-like appearance, Lundgren is truly impressive as a character defined by emotional emptiness. The best Punisher portrayal in the film is the 2004 one. Part of this is because we see Thomas Jane's version of the Punisher before he loses his family, as he loses them, and then after when he becomes the Punisher, so he is the most well-rounded. Lundgren was too young and inexperienced at the time. Dolph is doing a second-rate Stallone impersonation. I hate to say it, but yeah, kind of. I, I didn't, at, at first, I didn't, I, I was like, really? But yeah, it's, you know, reading these reviews before watching the movie, I, I felt like that that can't why would he be do but I, I don't know why the the end the movie did not answer why but he's definitely doing a second rate Stallone impersonation and it is not working he has fairly few lines a lot of them are short all of them are impactful there are a few really bad one liners but there are also some great ones he is bad at narration which is is too bad because the yeah there are a couple of narration parts. 
and he shows his naked butt. That was one of the worst things about this. Seriously, you can't handle that tiny part. That was phrased poorly. What I mean is, it's not hard. It's nothing to get excited about. Seriously, fellow straight guys, please stop freaking out about this kind of thing. It happened again with Watchmen. I think I also, I, I saw at least one person say, you know, oh, now that Terminator 3 is coming out, finally I don't have to stare at a man's naked ass in a movie. It's like, there's tons of male gaze in Western movies. Like, it's, it's, yeah, we, we have got to stop freaking out about it. And, yeah, one critic said, I still think the Punisher is a silly name for a homicidal revenge freak. It makes him sound like someone who's, who makes bad guys sit in corners or go to bed without supper. And, yeah, so Louis Gossett Jr. plays Detective Jake Berkowitz. And, yeah, uh, critic said, he's way too talented for this throwaway, if necessary, character. And, yeah, for, for sure, like, it's, yeah. I mean, essentially, without the the stuff before the the you know, basically Jake, it's it's up to him. He was the one who knew Frank before, you know. No, none of the other major characters really knew Frank. So there is this you know, and he he is trying to catch the Punisher, and there is this strong sense that you know, it's it's kind of like. In, in the first Halloween movie with Dr. Loomis, you know, our you know, the, the, the character that he's talking about doesn't talk that much, in any case of Michael, much, much less, if at all, and, yeah, I'm, I'm not going to say whether he ever speaks, because that's technically a spoiler, but yeah, the, the, um, he is, you know, it's a, the character is there, to give us some insight into, you know, what what drives this person, and kind of what, because it is like, you know, why would the Punisher go around constantly talking? You know, m almost all the time when he talks, it's to respond to someone, and, you know, the people he talks to aren't like, why are you doing this though? You know, most of the time, there's a little bit of that, but most of them, it's like. I think I get I, I get the vibe though. I, I understand why you're doing what you're doing. Because they've seen it and we haven't. We're told that this has been going on, you know. Like apparently he's killed like hundred and twenty-five people before the movie starts. You know. That by itself is just a statistic. You know, that's like you're like, wow, that's impressive for one guy. But that by itself is not really characterized. I mean uh, Jason Voorhees, I, I forget the count, but I think I read somewhere that he's killed over a hundred people, so, you know, it's not, they're, they're not doing it for the same thing, they're, they're, you know, the number by itself is not enough, and, yeah, that's where Louis Gossett Jr. comes in, and, yeah, Kim Miyori plays Lady Tanaka, and, According to IMB Trivia, it has been reported that Kim Miori was as fascinated by Dolph Lundgren's muscular body as the character she played. And she... <laughs> yeah, she, she touches his body directly. And that was apparently improvised by Miori. And yeah, I mean, it's it doesn't feel... You know, it's... it's yeah, it's, it's a bit like in the the... Um, is that a spoiler? That's not a spoiler. In the first Captain America movie of the, of the MCU, when I'm just gonna say there's a there's a female character who touches Captain America after he gets his muscles, and that was not in the script. That was you know the the actress really really wanted to, so she did, and. Yeah, like it it fits, you know, we are like the audience is supposed to be amazed at the muscular body, so it completely works. She is a stone cold badass. She is the most fun character in you know yeah, of, of every character in the entire movie. She dominates scenes that she's in. And, you know, basically she's she's the the female head of the Yakuza. 
Supposedly, she's trying to take over organized crime in New York. You get the sense that she could. She is just, like, the movie would be a lot poorer without her. Honestly, the, you know, parts of the movie, it was like, okay, this is kind of, oh, Lady Tanaka, great. You know, because she's, wow, she is just, like, completely, just, there. there's this, this sort of coldness. It's not that she doesn't feel anything, it's that she feels nothing positive towards her enemy. She has no empathy for her enemies. And that is just like, and she's, you know, she, she's talking to these mobsters, you know, who've been, you know, running New York for, for a long time, for years, you know, and she's like, just, I mean, she's talking to them kind of like, uh, I guess like they're, like she's like like she's ordering something at a restaurant. Like, so I would like this and this, and make sure when you when you cook the you know make sure that it's it's fully cooked through. Okay, you know, go go, go ahead. Like not not necessarily like super rude, but just like you know, there's no. She, she's like you are below me. We all know that you are below me. Here's what you're gonna do for me. I, th I think we're done here. I've, I've told you what you're supposed to do for me. We're done here. Bye. And it's so freaking cool. I, I'm really, really glad that, you know, the racism notwithstanding, she's just, yeah. And I think I will let that be the... I mean, Nancy Everhard is, is fine as Detective Samantha Sam Leary... I'm I'm not sure I would really, yeah, she, you know, and and her character is also important. Now that is it for the. Let's see. Yeah, I, there was there's this really great. While the uh, really re, critic quote, while the other characters then Punisher are underdeveloped. They're likable, and that is true. I, I wouldn't quite say all of them are memorable, but the the most like Lady Tanaka, awesome. The the major ones of like the the mob, the Italian mob. Yeah, I'd say you know I remember something about the the major ones, and yeah, they're you know they're they're. I enjoy watching them in the movie fine. You know, the, it's not the kind of thing where it's like, oh, this guy again. That brings us to the cinematography by Ian Baker, who has 23 movie credits as cinematographer, up to and including 2013 and as far back as 1971. And I gotta say, I do not know... I don't think I've watched any of these other movies. The I suppose the cinematography it's it's fine. It is sometimes somewhat bland and and not the most like yeah, not not the most compelling you know and and you know maybe it's down to you know it's it's a it's the the DP and the director responsible, and it was probably more that Mark Goldblatt was not used to directing because this you know twenty three credits over ah uh, let's see was that 50, 40, 42 years you know yeah that's and and it's not that it was the only movie he did from back then you know sometimes you know. Yeah, cinematography changes a lot over the, the years, but yeah. Yeah, it's just it's kind of kind of bland the and that brings us to the editing by Tim Wellburn, who has 35 credits as movie editor as late as 2009 and as far back as 1973. 
and a lot of the stuff that he's edited, I'm not Yeah, yeah, most of this I haven't watched. But he did edit Fortress, which is a tremendously well-edited movie. And it, you know, both of these movies are very dark in subject matter. And the editing is extremely important for that. Because anything that, I, I want to say it was Count Dracula, of the planet Dracula, who pointed out anything that can be that can be scary can also be funny you know it's it's very it's a very delicate balance you know and yeah you know on on fortress he does a really great job yeah the fact that this isn't quite as well edited as fortress i i think really must be that the the most um, yeah, the, the violence that the MPAA demanded be cut, they hadn't shot alternate takes, which is definitely not, you know, if you're working on a low budget, you're not going to shoot alternate takes of every single, you know, every time there's violence. Yeah, that's got to be, because Fortress, I'm not sure any violence was edited out. That is a very violent movie, so, yeah. The... I'm not sure. Yeah, I, I, I would say some of the action scenes should probably be trimmed down at least some. But yeah, you know, the editing tends to be very competent. You know, they, they build tension. There's some effective intercutting. And yeah, I mean, there is no action scene where I was lost. You know, which is, that's if you're watching an action scene by someone who does not usually, you know, edited by someone who doesn't usually edit action, it can really get just, yeah. And, yeah, you know, by, by and large, the, the editing is pretty good. And, yeah, so the, the budget was nine million, or estimated to be nine million at least. And, yeah, I, I have not found anything about the box office, but yeah, like, if it was, did it maybe only have a very limited theatrical release? I feel, yes, because earlier I saw that, you know, someone said it could have gone to, yeah, a lot of the premieres are DVD or TV or video Blu-ray, yeah. Um, yeah, if, if it didn't have a theatrical run, then, you know, I mean, I guess I could just very briefly see The Punisher, 1989, uh, what are they called again? Home video. Ah, uh, earnings. Um, let's see. Hmm. Yeah, I'm not, I can't really find anything. So. Yeah, um, you can tell that it didn't have a huge amount, but a lot of the budget is right there on the screen you know the the action for example sometimes has a maybe not expensive look to it but you can tell that okay this was not like shot by by someone who had no money at all and let's Yeah, so this was filmed in Australia for budgetary reasons, and some critics say you can you can tell since you know it is set in New York, and for sure, like you can't really like if it's the first Punisher movie, do not do Punisher goes down under. That is not gonna work as as well as just having him in New York, you know, maybe for a sequel, but uh, yeah, and yeah, some say that the sets are the only thing about the movie that isn't great for sure like you can tell that they 
didn't have the budget to go as big, but uh, yeah, there there are some pretty decent sets, certainly. There's this uh, casino that feels like, you know, people could actually, when, you know, it almost definitely wasn't, because film sets and actual locations, like, there's there's a little overlap, sure, but a lot of times what looks good for the camera would not work well to actually be in as, you know, if it wasn't being filmed. And, yeah, you know, the, the, the Yakuza have... See, that's again where the racism comes in, but there's there's some good set design when when it comes to the the yakuza, you know their their um, headquarters, and yeah, you know there there are various scenes where you know the movie sells. I feel that these, you know, some some of the time you're watching like these mobsters who've made a lot of money off regular people in New York and yeah you know they like to flaunt that money you know one of the first scenes is set at this mansion that one of the uh, you know crime heads lives in so you know because that is a big deal like if you don't believe that these mobsters are raking in the dough like it's what are, the, what are they doing then how are they in charge like New York has a lot of, of wealth so you know like if, if you don't buy that then it's like why is Frank going after these small timers instead of you know the 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 big because you know New York does have organized crime now that brings us to the action so all the fight sequences were performed with real contact by the actors to give the fights a sense of realism and because the Kyokushin Karate champions Kenji Yamaki and Hirofuma Fumi Kan Kanamyama's sense of honor would not allow them to fake it instead of hiring stuntmen to portray the Yakuza combatants the filmmakers specifically hired competitive Kyokun Shikai Karatekas and trained them per to perform their own stunts. And it really shows. Like, the. There's some really great fight choreography in this. And, yeah, like, honestly, overall, I think the, the, the physical fight part of the action is better than, you know, shooting and, and such. But the shooting is also pretty good it's it's maybe the the yeah the way the these are filmed and edited the the physical fights come out better than the shooting scenes and let's see yeah i think this this is a pretty good uh, yeah Critic quote, the director falters here in his action sequences. They seem like they nicely fit together, and I'm not sure if it was the poor photography of it or if it just didn't cut together, but most of the action sequences lack any kind of suspense. That is definitely a problem for it. And, you know, there are times where the... the yeah, I'm not going to give away what here but I'll talk about in the thought sections there are some times where it gets you know yeah it, it gets into situations where there's inherently tension but yeah for sure like a lot of it lacks suspense and at that point like you're look you know it it's maybe cool looking I, I would argue it's cool looking you know like I, I could um, yeah, like, if I were to recommend, you know, if, if someone asked me if they should watch this movie, you know, one thing I would probably say is the action looks pretty cool, you know, and that is, that's not always the case for 80s action. Not everybody, not everybody who directed 80s action were equally good at it. Um, but yeah, the fact that it lacks suspense does ultimately, and, and there's a lot of it, there's a lot of action in this movie. 
and the fact that most of it lacks suspense, that's kind of a problem. And that's also where, you know, that, that further makes it a problem that, as others pointed out, the scenes go on for too long. You know, if there's no suspense and we're just watching, you know, people firing guns, if, if it isn't really suspenseful, yeah, you, you really, action gets very tedious if it's not suspenseful. But yeah, some very cool guns. I love that several of them are completely unrealistic in what they accomplish. And on some covers and posters, Dolph is holding a def Desert Eagle, which is already the most powerful handgun. And they still felt the need to extend the barrel. It looks ridiculous, and I am here for it. And that brings us to the score. So this... The, the score was composed by Dennis Dreyf, who only composed for four movies. And one of them was Purple People Eater. Yeah. I think he did a, a perfectly fine job. Um, let's see. Yeah. Um, there's 57 minutes worth of the, of the score right here on YouTube. You know, I always say... You know, watch the movie also. You know, don't... Since it's free. Since, uh, not the movie, but the s soundtrack. Don't don't just listen to a free soundtrack if you're not also going to watch the movie. But yeah, you know, it's, it's worth listening to just... Yeah. There's original score and licensed music. Mostly original score, I believe. And yeah, it's intense, epic, bleak. It, it really fits well, very well. Composer Dennis Dreth used a small orchestra of Los Angeles musicians of about 37 players to create the memorable score for the film. Now, some critics said the score is flat and overbearing and terrible, and yeah, I, I disagree with them. But yeah, you, you might feel that way as well. And yeah, the, the sound design is alright. It's not, you know... It, it, yeah, the, the I, I already mentioned. <laughs> yeah, Commando, Rambo Two, and The Terminator all have better sound design. So, you know, it's it, again, it does not. It's not better than what came before. It's it's fine. It's enjoyable to watch, but it's not better than what came before, and that helps explain why it didn't really become a bigger deal. The pacing is. Fine. I felt like the, the plot would move ahead, you know, sufficiently frequently. Uh, you know, yeah, so the, the action scenes themselves get overlong, so that's an issue with pacing also. But the, yeah, I never felt like, you know, yeah, it's only 84 and a half minutes long, but I've seen movies of this length that feel like they're twice that. And, yeah, this is not that. This, it, you know... The, the action scenes are motivated. There's no action scene in this that's just, you know, oh, it looks kind of cool, you know. I, actually, I suppose there's one that's, you know, there for atmosphere, but it's not shot as anything other than atmosphere. It's not shot as a blow for blow, you can follow what's going on. It's shot as, you know, these people practice fighting all the time kind of thing, you know. And... Let's see, there's the... Um, yeah, you know, every action scene is motivated. There's no scene that's just whatever, you know, not, not really accomplishing. You know, yeah, some of them don't accomplish much, but none of, you know, if you removed any of them, there you could tell that there was supposed to be an action scene there. And I, you know, I agree that they're maybe excessive, but I don't, they don't waste too much time and let's see so so yeah as I mentioned you know plot and character tends to be tends to progress pretty nicely over the course of the movie yeah the movie is 84 and a half minutes long without end credits and 89 long with them and there's no reason for you to sit through the end credits. you know maybe have it on the background listen to the music sure but there's you know they're not visually compelling or anything and there's nothing after them. And yeah, um, 
if you let's say so usually I say maybe half an hour I'm not 100% certain I'm, I'm gonna do a really quick check let's see half an hour into this movie yeah yeah if you if you watch the first half hour you know of, of this movie if if half an hour into this movie you're not into it you're not interested in what happens after that go ahead and turn it off it's not there's there it, it has already shown you stuff that you know yeah now let's see so yeah let's see the best element is it it is legitimately most of the time a, a a bleak movie you you understand why frank you know that's that's one of the really big things when you watch a vigilantism movie and it doesn't have to be vigilantism with guns when you watch a vigilante you know a, a movie where the one of the ma major characters protagonist even is a vigilante it is very important that the movie gets across to the audience why vigilantism though why not call the cops or this or that or the other thing this movie really gets across like I completely under you know and I I don't agree with the vigilantism in in real life which I realize is interesting considering how much I love them in movies and, and comics and such but yeah you know I I start out as a very hard sell on vigilantism other than as just you know catharsis like and and yeah this movie did genuinely get across no it's, someone needs to stop these guys and the cops are not doing it you know and I would definitely have to say in my opinion the worst aspect of this was the racism uh, the worst thing, according to others, is that it's boring and tedious, and again, I didn't really feel that way about it. Now, uh, let's see, the, yeah, I was probably most worried about Dolph Lundgren's performance, and yeah, it's not good. And I was most looking forward to a Dolph Lundgren action flick I hadn't watched yet. And yeah, you know, if if you're a fan of his, you know, it's still not the best movie he ever made. But there's definitely, yeah, you know, I've I, I've never been unhappy with watching him in an action movie. Some of the action movies are bad, but he's always enjoyable to watch, even if. This is not his best work. Now, uh, the trailer does give at least a little bit too much away, but it is also the kind of thing that, um, yeah, um, it, it gets across what the movie is, is like. And I would definitely say the trailer is worth watching, and it is free right here on YouTube. I first watched the trailer as a kid, and, you know, I've been looking for a cheap copy of this, yeah, I don't know, 15 years, I guess. And now it's on Disney+, Plus, so I didn't have to spend any money, which ultimately I'm kind of glad. But, yeah, it's, yeah, the, the, I used to be able to recite every word of the trailer. I used to, I may or may not have, it on at least one occasion, acted it out. Let's see. Not for anyone else, but, you know, yeah. And the cover and poster do not give too much away, and they give you a good idea of what the movie is like, and, yeah, some of them are worth looking up on IMDb. So, yeah, that brings us to the... Rotten Tomatoes, um, yeah. This has a 24% on the tomato meter, which makes it rotten, based on 17 reviews, and only a 33% audience score based on over 50,000 ratings. 
Despite the seemingly indestructible Dolph Lundgren with crossbow, The Punisher is a boring one-man battle with never-ending action scenes, is the critics' consensus. So yeah, the average rating for critics was 3.50 out of 10. Only four of the 17 reviews were fresh. And the, yeah, 33% gave it more than uh, 3.5 3 out of 5. And yeah, um, the average rating for users was 2.7 out of 5, which, yeah, that's lower than I would go. But I will get to my rating in a very short amount of time. And on Metacritic, wait, is that, hold on. Uh, I just gotta double check this. Does it not have the right? Um, Metacritic and movies. For some reason it says that it came out in 2009. I guess that was one of the DVDs or something. But anyway, yeah. Um, it has a 63 out of 100 based on four critic reviews and 6.5 out of 10 based on six critic uh, user ratings. And there are four reviews by the users. A 1 out of 10, two 6 out of 10s, and a 10 out of 10. Yeah, that, that makes a lot more sense than the Rotten Tomatoes ones. On IMDb, it only has 202 user reviews, 171 without spoilers. I read all 202 of them. And the ones mo voted most useful of, of, the, of the top 100. One gave it one out of ten, three, two out of ten, three for three out of ten, one for four out of ten, eleven for five out of ten, sixteen for six out of ten, twenty-four for seven out of ten, fourteen for eight out of ten, six for nine out of ten, and fifteen for ten out of ten. So yeah, some people do really, really love this movie. And I completely understand why. And yeah, this has a 5.6 out of 10 on IMDb, which I feel is low. Based on 23,940 IMDb users and 23.6 gave it 6, 19.5 gave it 5, 15.3 gave it 7, 8.1 gave it 10, 7.7 .7 gave it 8. 10.5 gave it 4, 5.8.1 oh, gave it 10, 5.8 gave it 3, and the remaining ones are 3% or thereabouts. So, yeah. And, yeah, uh, these special effects are not particularly special or the most effective. They're fine. Um, yeah, you know, you have gunshot wounds and knife wounds and that kind of thing. And they're, yeah, they're, they're fine. They're not, like, glaringly, obviously fake. Yeah, that's about... There are some really good stunts, though. Uh, some of the fights look really, really good because of the stunt work. And yeah, the the it's not a ridiculously violent film, but for just the the catharsis of just, you know, seeing bad people face violence because they themselves dish out violence, yeah, it's it's fine. It's not one of those that's just completely toothless in its violence. And let's see. And and some of the time the violence helps inform character. Some of the characters are very quick to violence, and especially ah, what's the word? Especially cruel in their violence. 
whereas others, you know, for others it's a means to an end, and so, yeah. You know, that is obviously... I don't think violence always has to mean something in movies, but I think it's very, very good when it does. And yeah, there will be a couple of links in the description box for written reviews, and there's especially one that's really great at talking about the racism in the movie, and I will also be linking to the abridged script now. Let's see. Right, so... Who do I recommend this to? I think people who love the comic book character, most most of them are going to be very unhappy. And I, yeah, I, uh, I wish... Rotten Tomatoes, I can't help but wonder how many, because like a 33%, that means that 67% didn't think it was particularly good. But basically, you know, it's still a, it's a flawed system. It's, you know, yes, yes or no, it's, it's too binary, uh, you know, but yeah, a lot of regular people didn't like it. I, I think a lot of them, and again, I don't, I don't begrudge them that, but I think a lot of them were big fans of the comics who were really psyched to see an adaptation of such a cool character. And they didn't... Yeah, they felt it was too removed from the comics. And again, like, considering... Like, I'm not gonna say that the 1989 Batman is completely flawless, but, like, if you really wanted to see the Joker on screen, holy crap, Tim Burton... Wow, you know, Tim Burton and Jack Nicholson really nailed it. He is really, really just the the kind of the gleeful terror that he you know, the, the, the glee with which he inflicts terror upon others is just perfect. And the the suit and the makeup, you know, yeah, it's it's a huge disappointment compared to that, you know, and the Punisher isn't really that diff you know, again, like traded one war for another the the yeah uses guns and the the this thing of the wait what was the th anyway yeah among the things that you know that he didn't trade one war for another he uh, I I do you know the the violence he he inflicts could be you know could be construed as warlike, but it doesn't feel like war to, to the viewer, com again, compared to the Terminator, you know, future flashbacks, and, and the, you know, the way that Kyle and the Terminator attack each other is, like, okay, there's, there's only one of each, but it's basically a war. It's not just, like, yeah. And, and, you know, Rambo 2 and Commando, you know, yeah. Honestly, I think a lot of people who, you know, yeah, I would, I would recommend, yeah, if you, if you just, you know, for, uh, the bad guys kidnap one or more kids, I'm gonna kill them, watch Commando. For a better Dolph action movie, watch Universal Soldier. And the, currently, on Disney+, Plus, this has no extras, and I don't have a DVD, so I cannot speak to those, but... Yeah, you know, it's basically, it has every. There, there are not very many Marvel movies that are not on D Disney Plus, at least in in Europe by now. Uh, you still can't watch the old Captain America movies, which is probably because they like people not hating Captain America. I, I haven't I haven't watched them yet, but I I've heard they're terrible though. But but yeah, you know, there's not very many Marvel movies anymore. And I guess Blade, although I heard that they were on some, was that maybe the American uh, Disney Plus? But yeah, maybe they'll put them on there when the when they put out the new one. You know, but yeah, like every X Men movie. Uh, actually come to think of it do they have new seems like they still don't have new mutants on 
here, but other than that, you know, the entire Fox X-Men run. Now, let's see. Yeah, so, um, I guess, yeah, I, my, my final rating is seven vigilantes out for justice out of ten, and this is a movie that I could watch again soon, maybe not today, but like a week from now, I, I might watch it again, yeah. I I enjoyed watching it, I, I, I'm not sure I would say I was ever like really bored, but there were times where my interest was starting to wane, but then Lady Tanaka would come back in, or you know, there would be some kind of just, yeah. And... Yeah, you know, ultimately, it's it's too bad. I don't think the budget completely destroyed its chances, but an inexperienced Dolph Lundgren, who did not get enough proper, like, guidance from director, uh, you know, because, like, honestly, if he had played this role somewhat like I Ivan Drago, it wouldn't fit perfectly, but it would be a better performance at least. You know, so it's not like he couldn't have done, you know. And I feel like he understood the character and wanted people at home to be like, yes, go, you know, cheering him on kind of thing. I, I don't think he mistook this for, like, a really dark, uh, uh, downer take on the character kind of thing. Uh, but, but yeah, inexperienced Dolph Lundgren... Mark Goldblatt not really knowing enough about that direction. I, I wish they had gotten... Because not everybody who's like... inexperienced director or low-budget director, not all of them are actually really... You know... Yeah, you know, so, some of them are still really, really good at... Uh, yeah. I, I do think that it is probably, if you, if you haven't watched it before, and the first viewing is today, you're not going to feel that like the action is as excessive as others have felt. I, I can completely understand. Back in 89, this probably felt like just punishing. And, yeah. That brings us to the, the worst to best filmed the, the yeah worst to best punisher film including this one both film and punisher actors performance ultimately i got to say yeah worst to best 89 2004 and warzone and yeah you know let's see Yeah, so the rest of the video will contain spoilers. And we are going to start with notes taken while watching. I mean, I will say, like, thinking about going to record this movie, I thought that my video would be really, really short, and that's already an hour and 48 minutes. So, yeah, I, I got more into it than I had guessed before watching. I won't deny uh, right. No, yeah, I already did. Yeah. I won't deny that it's a pretty cool entrance of the character. I really like that we don't see his face at first, not until he walks out of the mansion. But why was the Punisher just sitting on his motorfire motorcycle, knife and boot in the full black garb during the day outside the trial? There are journalists with cameras hungry for a story right there. I mean, when he appears at the mansion entrance later on, you know, yeah, he's giving them a good full shot, but I mean yeah, is that him faking? Wait, was this ah crap, I forget was the was the opening of the movie was that did he kill them and then we get then we jump ahead 5 years or does or was this at the end of the 5 years I think I will quickly see because the building blows up the mansion blows up afterwards which is also like how does he survive that and it 
yeah, the movie, the movie never explains how on earth he survived. And yeah, I that's very yeah. Um, let's see. Okay, I'm not 100% sure if. Um. Yeah, I guess that is the end of the that or th that is after the five years of time. Anyway, but but yeah, um, what was he gonna do if someone filmed him on the motorcycle and Moretti found out? And you know, and since it's a courthouse, courthouse, there's got to be cops nearby. That really screws up his stealth attack of the mansion. That's a pretty ridiculous explosion of the mansion. It even, even explodes twice. I guess they thought they were making a movie about a killer space alien. Certainly around that time, you'd have one or more of the following. A ridiculous explosion, two explosions. Do you really think you're the first to apply for this job? No, but I'm the most qualified. She has the vibe of someone who is actually right about that, so not Herschel Walker. The scene at the pier is fun. I don't really have anything else to say that isn't in the abridged script. So, you know, they did a really great job on that. Nailing everything. Yeah. Punisher looks really hurt when he's like, you know, he's got this wound on, on his chest. I'm wounded. I have to get to a place that's nice and antiseptic. Like the fucking sewer. She's the first female head of the Yakuza. So not only is the villain Japanese, but also female. Oh, shit. This is an 80s movie. She must be pure evil. And later in the movie, she emasculates a masculine man by penetrating his mouth and killing him. And she wants the, you know, she tries to push the, uh, I'm going to call him Tommy's dad, because I remember that the kids call Tommy. But yeah, she tries to push him into shooting himself as well. Miss Tanaka may not be as theatrical with her entrances as the Punisher, but damn, she is badass. Let's see. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I said most of what I have to say about the scene when she walks into the boardroom, I guess it is, of the of the mafioso, but yeah, it was it was completely it was incredible. Like she's like, you misunderstand. I'm not making an offer. I'm you know, th this is not something I'm asking for. This is I'm making demands, you know, and just yeah. And right, I to take a brief break from I, I only I realized it as I was recording the the review itself. Tanaka's daughter, like at first she's you know they mention oh yeah she she doesn't have any she doesn't have any real children, you know she only adopted ah, what a monster, <laughs> like what is the exactly like adoption is is a wonderful thing to do in the real world but anyway yeah she adopted this mute American girl. And, you know, they just say, oh, yeah, you know, and she killed her own brother. She's so heartless. She's destructive to the American family. Oh, I mean, family in general, not only the American family. And the, the yeah, you know, like, yeah, some of what I'm saying here, read the, read the, you know, click the link in the description box. You know, they, they explain the, the, the racism really well. And, and this whole, yeah, the, the, let's see. Yeah, you know, at, at first it's just, oh, she's she's there. Like, I think every single scene Tanaka has, either her daughter is in the scene, like, at, yeah, at the end she fights Dolph while Tanaka is, is uh, well, let's see, not, not holding a gun, the, 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 ma the mafioso is holding a gun on her, and she's got a knife to Tommy, you know, and she's like, if, you know, if if I kill him and you kill me, you lose infinitely more than I do. <laughs> and yeah, it is this thing of the daughter is always there. Yeah, I, she's Isn't she even there in those... I, I believe she's even there in the torture scene. You know, she's, she's just always... Let's see. I will very quickly be able to tell... Is that her in the background? Yeah, yeah, that's her right there. She's always near Tanaka. And for a while of the movie, you might be wondering, like, what is she that? Oh, oh, right, right. Mother, daughter, they probably have a close relationship, you know. And, you know, then as it gets further, 
you come to realize or, you know, Tanaka's idea of a daughter is someone that she can turn into, like, basically this is, like, yeah, yeah, she says, you will, you know, if, if I kill your son and you kill me, you lose more than I do, because my adoptive daughter will take over, and she is just as ruthless as I am, and just as good at, you know, doling out this, this violence, because for a lot of the movie, she's, she's there, and, you know, there's, there's a scene where she's like, she's like in a, in a training, uh, what are they, what do they call, like, um, spandex, or, or something, like, she's working out kind of thing, you know, work, work out clothes, not training, uh, yeah, in Danish, the word for workout and training is the same, that's why, I've, you know, obviously training is different from working out, and you know she she goes to the the yeah there's that bit where they poisoned the the people by the the glass not not even the champagne but the glass and one of them you know he said no I'm I'm not drinking I'm on medication and I it would have been kind of funny if if they went the full because I I'm just saying my mind immediately went to Monty Python. I didn't even touch the pate, you know. But no, you know, he's he gets killed in another way. And you know, it is also like that they make sure to kill the they they gun down the bodyguards, but no no no, they poisoned the the you know, yeah. And the guy, you know, he didn't have any. So he's got, you know, and let's see. I think he draws the gun and and then that's right. Yeah, she's she's got the yeah she's got the spandex on, and she's in like, uh, is that a doge? No, no, not quite a doge. Yeah, yeah, she's like, she's working at she she's got this uh, punching bag, and she's like kicking it, and we don't see much of it, but it's just like just to put it in the back of our mind. Oh, she's she's working out, you know, because if you never see her work out, it's like how how is she that good at it if she's you know. But beyond just being healthy, no, she's actually, she is a killing machine, just like the, yeah. And let's see, yeah, so the, yeah, they've been poisoned. Yeah, yeah, the, the uh, hold on, did I? Yeah, so all of the, all the bodyguards are gunned down. And the guy who didn't drink anything you know, shouts, you fucking bitch, at Tanaga, and so her daughter stands up for her, and it's her earrings that are these tiny little, yeah, basically like blades, you know, every part of her is a weapon, kind of thing, and yeah, she, she you know, basically crucifies him to the wall, and let's see, yeah, and, the, and then Tanaka you know, yeah, yeah, Tanaka offers, you know, yeah, she says, drink some poison, and when he doesn't, she sticks a gun in his mouth, his his own gun in his mouth, but, but yeah, you know, so it's like, oh, wow, so she has these little blade things to, to throw, okay, so she's, she's dangerous from a distance, then, you don't want to piss her off, because she's going to throw these, these, which, you know, after all, I mean, they're, they're pretty small, they're not, it's, it's not like throwing knives, so it's still, you know, it's like, okay, respect, but hmm, could be bigger, and then when the Punisher is there, like, she kicks his ass for a while, you know, yeah, she ends up getting killed, and it's that thing of, wait, is that progressive, because it does still end with him killing a woman, you know, yeah, I'm, I'm not gonna get into that, I, I, I think, uh, yeah, the bottom line is, when she turns out to be a, you know, an incredibly capable fighter, it doesn't feel like it comes out of nowhere, but it is something that you didn't necessarily see come, like, earlier, in, in her earlier scenes, you don't necessarily think, oh, she's definitely going to kick out, like, you know, let's see, um, the Van Damme movie, ah, what's it called again, Double, Double Impact, you know, I'm just going to make absolutely sure that I have the right one. Yes, Double Impact, where Van Damme plays two twins. 
you know, you spend that entire movie knowing, okay, okay, at some point, Bolo Young is going to demolish someone, you know, he's going to kick so much ass, even though, as if I recall, he doesn't, like, over the course of the movie, he's not necessarily, like, constantly kicking ass, but, like, nobody is, like, surprised when he is kicking ass, you know, N not saying that that makes, you know, I would, I would choose, I would say that movie is better than this one, it ha the, the action is, is better than this one. But, but yeah, like, I really appreciate that, and, and, you know, like I mentioned, you know, violence is used to characterize people. Tanaka and her daughter are cruel in their violence, where, you know, Punisher himself doesn't go out of his way to be cruel. Like, he's fairly, like, he, he kills people, you know, what, like, when he attacks the casino, he's basically just delivering the message, you know, we don't want you here. But I'm I'm gonna start by destroying your your property. You know, the, you know he's basically taking a, a page, you know, a, uh, taking a page from the mafioso book. You know, if they don't, if if you know, yeah, if if the mafia don't, you know, demand, you know, if if you don't pay protection protection money, then they will destroy your business, and that's it. You know, but the the yeah, and and. The mafia people themselves, I'm not sure, are especially motivated by cruelty either. I mean, they they did think, you know, it's uh, I'm, I guess it's not 100% clear from the movie's flashbacks itself. But if you look, uh, if you watch the entire, you know, the entire prologue right here on YouTube, again, it's very low quality, unfortunately. You know, they didn't. Um, you know that's that's what happens with film. It was shot on film, and they didn't, you know, take crazy good care of it. They didn't have money to restore it to a really good quality. So yeah. Anyway, when they when they released it on DVD, I mean, but yeah, the the let's see. I think it is that the bomb was in the car, and it's one of those where when you turn the key, it explodes, and his wife was getting the car for him. And the kids were in the backseat, something like that. You know, he was going to get in the car, but she started the, the car engine, and that's why, you know, the, the mafioso were intending to kill him. You know, they, yeah, they thought that he would get in his car, drive to work, and thus, you know, I, I think they basically figured, well, you know, okay, maybe the family dies too, but we got to get rid of Punisher. He's screwing up our business, you know. Now, I really appreciate um, the drunk actor pointing out this is the result of his five-year killing spree. You know, of course, it would make the, you know, it didn't, it didn't quite create a power vacuum yet, but it did make it look like they're essential, you know, it made the mafia look like pushovers. It made it look like the, the you know, the Yakuza could easily take a, you know, which, I mean, technically, they could. If not for the Punisher, they would have. So, yeah. I want to go home, and you will, soon. How soon? And, yeah, Frank destroys the casino. I don't really have anything to say that isn't in the abridged script. What the hell is this? It's called a tattoo, dude. And, yeah, so we, you know... Jake is certain that Punisher didn't take the kids because he had kids of his own. So, you know, really underlining, oh, Tanaka, these Japanese people are destroying American families. Let's see. Yeah, I, I, I hate xenophobia in all its forms, and racism against Japanese people in the 80s was just, yeah. I agree that American, you know, white Americans lost jobs because of some of the Japanese, like, expansion, but they were beating Americans at their own game. They were doing better at capitalism, and because of that, they got demonized in all these American movies. It's just really gross. I gotta say, the part at the carnival where... Punisher moves through what are they called again? The the mirror. Um, I'm not expecting you to answer. I'm talking out loud instead of 
letting there be dead air. Um, not not magic mirror, but the uh, it, it, whole of mirrors is that what it's called? But you know, that was really cool. Uh, I wish there had been more of that in the movie. And again, you know, yeah. Maybe, maybe it shouldn't have been there because it kind of made me think, oh, wow, are they going Enter the Dragon with this? Because that would be amazing. And they, of course, don't. So that's... I guess what I'm trying to say is watch Enter the Dragon. If, if un Unless you hate the idea of martial arts performed by Bruce Lee, you know, watch the movies. It's amazing. It holds up. And... Yeah, the torture scene is appropriately visceral. I really appreciated that. Like, you know, you have the, the close-up on Dolph's face. Is, uh, you know, ow, that hurts. And you have the the thing with the, um, what's it called? The, the around his his uh, wrist and how it pulls, you know, and you see the, the stretching mechanism also. That was, that was very nicely done. What was with... Why were there red high heel... Yeah. Okay, so when they put the torturer on his own rack, there's like red high heel... And one of them is on his... What, what was that? Oh, wait, was that like something that was cut and then they couldn't completely remove it from them? Was... was Because like, I guess... Oh, I could actually... Maybe, maybe Lady Tanaka like hit him with the bottom of the high heel before the stretching and the MPA were like that's too much and so the shoes were still there yeah I don't know you know I mean it looks like they put the shoes on the torturer afterwards I guess to humiliate him maybe or something yeah which is just transphobic and just really gross yeah trans rights or human rights and let's don't be afraid I'm here to take you home you know you smell like toilet right and Tommy fights to protect Frank and that's actually why Tommy is left behind you know Frank had to to leave to get the kids away from there and it's yeah I really appreciate it. like Tommy that's another thing, like, when, you know, when it spends, several, like, maybe a minute or two on, you know, ah, oh, look, I got this cool coin trick, I, you know, and, and the, you know, the father's like, ah, go, you know, go, go tell the waiter to get you some more cheesecake, son, and, you know, then they talk business kind of thing, you know, it's like, I mean, the kid didn't really need to be in that scene, but then you realize, no, like, that's why he's willing to work with the Punisher, nothing matters to him as much as this kid, you know. He really wants the, the, yeah, and, and, uh, yeah, I have more to say about the kit, but it's in the next section. And a Yakuza grabs the window of the bus, and the kid, you know, he's got, like, his fingers over, and the kids come and, like, yank his fingers off, and then he gets run over by one of the other, that is, yeah. And that's, again, like, what is wrong with you? Why are you just... He's taking kids away, you know, he, like, I could understand attacking the Punisher if he was still, tr like, doing really destructive things, you know, but it's, it's a bus full of innocent kids, just, yeah. And Punisher allows his capture rather than risk cops hurting the kids trying to shoot him. Say something, I'm giving up on you. And Punisher gave the actor a gun just like the actor asked for earlier and a knife with the logo so that allies will recognize that he is with the Punisher and good tension between Frank and Tommy's dad I like that bit where you know he raises his gun towards Punisher and shoots and Punisher's like what and, you know and then a guy falls over dead behind him and it's like he could have said, duck, Frank, but no, he chose to, you know, because, yeah, he is, yeah, he is still a, a bad guy. And, let's see, yeah, really, really great fight between Frank and, you know, Tanaka's daughter, and before that, the, the, there was that Yakuza who, like, um, I hesitate, I, I'm not sure it's quite a chain, but it's some kind of swinging thing that he uses to grab Frank's gun and whip it out of his hand, 
And then he, you know, the Yakuza has this martial arts weapon, and Frank has nothing. That was actually kind of suspenseful and tense. I wish the movie got guns out of his hands more frequently, because that is basically the, you know... And, I mean, ultimately, all three of these movies manage to put Punisher in at least one situation where it's like, I mean, what is he going to do? How is he going to get out of this alive? And, yeah, I quite appreciate that. You know, he he basically doesn't have problems when he has his guns, so... Yeah, that was, yeah, you know, and there was that fight in the the carnival when, you know, first he shoots a bunch of them, and it's, you know, yeah, like I quoted a critic saying, there's no real suspense here, so it's just, we're just watching, it's, it's kind of cool, sure, but there's like, it doesn't, you don't get a strong sense of, oh, they're closing in on him, he's gonna run out of bullets, like a, like a, a zombie movie or something, you know, because that is basically, they're, they're throwing numbers at the problem here, you know, and, and, but, but yeah, once they're close to him, and they're, like, hitting him from different, you know, that was effective. I, I yeah, it, it would have been really cool if they did that more in, in the movie. And I, at first I felt like that was it for Tanaka. Like, Frank just kills Tanaka, and then, you know, there, you know there's not really a final fight there. But the fight between him and her daughter was great, so, yeah. And that brings us to the very last section, notes taken before watching. Holy crap, this, yeah, this video got at least twice as long as I thought it was going to. Now, yeah, so some IMDb trivia. The Punisher never uses the same weapon twice. He will also leave them behind for no reason. <laughs> yeah. The scene where the Punisher is being tortured on the stretching machine, director Mark Goldblatt said that a lot of Dolph Lundgren's responses were largely improvised, and some did make the final cut of the film. Others, which were a little offensive, were deleted. So you realize that you could delete some, but you chose to leave in... <sighs> okay, I'm going to try to to mentally recreate, because it's such a bad, bad one-liner. She asks him, how much pain do you think that buys? And he answers... Is is this a is is the answer true false or multiple choice? And it's like, why would it be true false? Like, okay, multiple choice, like multiple choice, sure, but true false? How could it be true false? It's just, you know, and it and it's so like there's there's another one right there. Just have him respond. Oh, hold on. Crap. Yeah, that does wait, that doesn't work. I gotta re I gotta think of another one real quick. You know, yeah, um have him Yeah, just have him respond something like Enough money to shut you up or something like that. You know, you you can yeah. The character of Shake is supposed to be the Punisher's conscience and humanity in this film, which is quite similar to the 2004 reboot in which Rebecca Romaine's character is Thomas Jane's positive voice, and both Julie Benz and Wayne Knight as Microchip, Punisher's partner in the comic book, are for Ray Stevenson in Punisher Warzone. Yeah, I, re I really appreciate that, because, you know, some of these movies really don't have that kind of thing, and ultimately, again, it's, you know, if that's what you want to do, that's fine, but I do think that it is, you know, if if the violence that they were suggesting was a proper solution to problems, like, you know, there are situations where, you know, but, yeah, most real-life situations, violence doesn't solve a conflict, you know, to, yeah, doesn't, doesn't ultimately solve something. It might, in the short term, mean that, you know, the the people that you're killing won't be killing, but then, you know, what if someone you know, decides that they were right and then, you know, c commits new violence against you, you know. So, yeah, if you're going to do this kind of thing, it's good to have that kind of, you know, yeah, guiding light in there. 
At around 44 minutes, when Frank is being tortured and interrogated by Lady Tanaka, Frank ta tells Lady Tanaka that Batman sent him, an improvised, not in the shooting script, re reference to the Batman DC comic book about billionaire Bruce Wayne becomes the masked vigilante Batman after both his parents were murdered in front of him when he was a boy. Five years after the release of the movie, The Punisher did two comic crossovers with Batman. The first was titled Batman The Punisher League of Fire. The second uh, comic was titled Punisher and Batman Deadly Nights. They're both quite good. I, I recommend them. Uh, I've, I've read them multiple times, and yeah, they're some of my favorite Punisher books, honestly. And and also Batman, but I've read a lot less Batman than I've read Punisher. And let's see. Um, yeah, um, one critic said that Frank shoots really randomly in some of the scenes. I, yeah, that's that's true. And yeah, some people said that it gets the best part out of the way in the first ten minutes. I disagree. I, I find the... I get the catharsis of it, but I think it's one of the least interesting stories. Speaking only of, of fictional, you know, obviously, if a tragedy happens to you, like, you know, you will... you wish there was someone you could hurt. I, you know, I lost my mother when I was 12, you know, but you can't punch cancer. And the... the yeah. You know, I get it. It's cathartic, but it's not that interesting of a story, ultimately. I think this was a much more interesting story. You know, him f freeing kidnapped children and even working with one of the mobsters, you know, that's a much more interesting story than just, uh, you know. But I, I, you know, yeah, I've already mentioned that I think overall the 2004 movie is better. That one spends a, a good amount of time on the, on the origin story. I'm not going to give away here how much. I, I do think that works well for that one. You know, they're also defining, you know, you, ultimately you don't need a lot, you don't need to spend a lot of time to explain why a white American is angry and want to kill people with guns. You know, that's just kind of Tuesday. So, yeah, you know, you, you can't jump directly into the mayhem as this movie does. The 2004 movie doesn't just want to be that, you know, it, and, and, yeah, you know, it, it adds a lot of characterization to Frank. We see how he changes, how he reacts to these very different circumstances. Honestly, it's too bad this movie didn't get sequels. It would have been very easy, like, have Frank go take care of the crime in another city, or maybe he has to contend with someone trained specifically to take him out. Maybe he has to take on a partner and their methods are very different. Maybe he has to protect an innocent person, like, over a, a chunk of time, not just the the kind of, um, not, not just free and kidnapped children. Which, you know, ultimately is not a huge chunk of the running time of this movie. And, yeah, so the reason why the movie has Frank rescue the children of mobsters is so that he isn't only seen killing, you know, killing people to make him more sympathetic. And it underlies, underlines that he thinks evil is a choice, not genetic. At the end, he gives Tommy a chance to shoot him, you know, for being upset he killed his father. And... Ultimately, the kid, you know, can't bring himself to do it, and he tells him, you're a good kid, grow up to be a good man, otherwise I'm coming for you too. And this kid, you know, Tommy did get in a fight with another kid to defend his father's honor when they were kidnapped, setting up he has a temper. You know, obviously there's a huge difference between punching, a, you know, someone who's antagonizing you, which that other kid certainly was doing. I don't condone hitting people, but... Yeah, you know, that, that kid was like, okay, you know that he's going to punch you now. That's 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 what's in the cards here. But I guess that other kid maybe isn't good at, you know, he's maybe he his temper comes out in him, you know, shit-talking people. So, yeah. Let's see. And, you know, and, and I mean, he's he's quoting his father. He's saying, you know, my father says that if your father had just been tough enough, the Yakuza wouldn't have come. And that is the kind of thing that a mafia person would say, you know. And I also I also like the this thing of, you know, all the families try to work together because Frank has killed so many of the different ones. So, you know, they'll be stronger together, but even together, they're not strong enough to fight the Yakuza. That... You know, I appreciate that detail. And let's see. Yeah, yeah. The thing. Yeah. 
obviously there's a huge difference between you know punching someone and shooting someone but he did just watch Frank kill his father and you know ultimately and that's also something I appreciate it was in self-defense I like to think that even this Punisher even as far gone as he is you know if there wasn't a gun right there he would have tried to get Tommy further away from his father before killing the father I'm sure he would have killed the father regardless but I like to think that he wouldn't have done it right in front of a kid considering that it's kind of the reverse of what happened to him you know he lost his ch child his child I forget if if he had a son or if they were both girls but he lost two children right in front of him and now this child lost his father right in front of him so you know obviously that is something that he and and he does like he legitimately seems to understand why Tommy wants to kill him you know and he's he's basically testing him and yeah w once Frank has lost his entire family he does the only thing that could possibly make things better. He goes to the sewers in search of Ninja Turtles. When he fails to find any, he decides to make a new home there and take up vigilantism for himself. Seriously though, when the Ninja Turtles came from the sewers, that was because they were satire, parody of bad comic book tropes. Just have him operate out of a seemingly abandoned building like a normal vigilante. And in the opening, you know, in the, in the mansion, one of the guys is, you know, hanged by an unseen figure above him. He really should have been notified that someone was coming up. Someone serious. So, yeah, with that, I have watched and done at least one video for each of all of the Punisher movies. And I am in the process of watching the Punisher Marvel Netflix show. Every video I do, I have done on something Punisher is linked in the description box. And that playlist will be updated as I do videos. You know, I'm going to do a season one thoughts on the Punisher, season two thoughts on the Punisher, and a review of Marvel Netflix Punisher once I have watched all of it. And all of them will go on that description box. So that is a great place, great link to check out if you want to know what I think of the other Punisher movies and to keep an eye on if you, you know, you could also subscribe. I swear I won't punish you if you don't. So hit me up in the comments. Let me know what is your favorite vigilante with a gun movie what do you think of this movie you know is there something that you think they could have done better or worse and yeah you know what do you think of my sequel ideas do you have sequel ideas of your own if you like this video please thumbs up subscribe hit that little bell like it killed frank's family there should be a link to my main channel page one two more links to stuff like relevant playlists a suggested video for you to watch on the screen right about now i put out one vlog per week reviewing and sharing the yeah yeah reviewing and sharing spoiler thoughts on a movie and one talking about my spoiler filled thoughts on the most recent episode of the current disney plus star wars show which these days live action show which these days is and or and recently the review and thoughts videos tend to come out very similar to this one in other words if you want videos like this you're in luck you can check out my back catalog as well as catch my video next week i hope you enjoyed watching as i enjoy watching and recording and i will catch you next time